Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you all enjoyed your, uh, your refreshment, your mid-morning refreshment. We are now into the second session of the morning, which is uh, our keynote address, and that will be followed by a panel discussion. Now, it's my uh, great privilege to introduce the keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Harsha Trupana, who's a very old friend of mine. Right, we've known each other since uh, we were in school. I was a few years ahead of him. Right, so it's been uh, over 45 years, I think. And uh, he was still in school when we uh, found ourselves uh, teammates on the Sri Lanka national chess team in the late 1970s. Uh, after that, Hush joined this university, the University of Colombo got a bachelor's degree in economics, went on to get uh, a master's degree and a PhD in economics from the University of Cambridge in the UK. Then he came back and joined this university as uh, a senior lecturer in economics before moving on to the World Bank, where he is now uh, a lead economist and uh, for uh, a couple of decades now or more, he has been uh, helping the World Bank fund higher education in Sri Lanka, as well as doing a number of other things. So he's worked for the World Bank in, uh, in all over the world, really, in every continent, as far as I can tell, except South America and uh, Australia. And he has uh, supervised World Bank projects that covered higher education, uh, education in general, health, social protection, economic reform, and strengthening government processes. So he has vast experience to uh, speak to us today on a topic that I think will be of great interest. And on a personal note, I can tell you that uh, both in uh, personal conversations as well as public discourse, I personally have learned a great deal by listening to Harsha, and I look forward to learning even more today, and I trust that uh, applies to all of you. Harsha's keynote address, I think, will, uh, will help us all uh, put what we do, which is science, into the broader context of society. The title of his keynote address is Human Capital, Employment, and Economic Empowerment. So without any further ado, uh, Harsha, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gunratna. So to the Vice Chancellor and academics of the University of Colombo, thank you very much for inviting me to give this keynote address uh, to which I have been looking forward with great pleasure. The title of my address, as uh, Dr. Gunratna mentioned, is Human Capital, which is an extremely important component in economic thinking on the development of countries, on employment, which is extremely important, of course, for all of us who are job seekers and who need to work for a living, and economic empowerment, which really means a job that provides adequate income uh, to support a family or to support oneself in employment. What we are now seeing in the global economy is what is called the fourth industrial revolution. The first industrial revolution was from about 1760 onwards and was based on mechanical production and so revolutionary innovations such as steam powered industrial production and railway based transport. So we know, for example, that the first industrial revolution was really the platform for modern economic growth, starting in the United Kingdom, but then moving on to Europe and also the, the Americas, both North America and South America, and also Australia. 
Asia also benefited from the first industrial revolution, but to a lesser extent uh, than some of the other, con the other continents I mentioned. Then we had the second industrial revolution from around the 1860s, so about 100 years after the first industrial revolution commenced. And so, for instance, the widespread application of electricity and the use of the assembly line and mass production in manufacturing industry. The period of the second industrial revolution benefited countries in Asia more, including Sri Lanka. So if we go back to Sri Lanka's economic history at that time, we were of course called Ceylon. The plantation agriculture industry really took off in the middle of the 19th century. So with coffee production from about the 1840s, tea production later in the 19th century and rubber. And what we saw is that uh, there were certain industries that really came up in the late 19th century, the plumbag or graphite industry, for example, and also processing of tea and rubber which used mass production in industry. These were very localized plants, but we saw this in, uh, in Sri Lanka. So we also benefited in the 19th century from the second industrial revolution. In fact, uh, the graphite mines at Bogala and the, and the Plumbago mines were supposed to be the first mines in, in these areas that used heavy machinery and also electricity to light up the mines. Then we have around the world, the third industrial revolution about a hundred years later from about the 1960s onwards with increasingly automated production and the widespread use of electronics and computers. And the third industrial revolution benefited uh, Asian countries, East Asia, uh, countries such as, for example, South Korea, and so on, and Thailand, Malaysia, and so on, but also to some extent, Sri Lanka. Uh, increasingly uh, to industrialize during the period of the 1970s and 1980s. And then we have the fourth industrial revolution now, uh, which is based on developments such as artificial intelligence, big data, robotics, biotechnologies and neurotechnologies. And what we saw from the first industrial revolution from 1760 onwards, is that as the nature of economic production and jobs were transformed by their technological advances, uh, the demands for human capital also were transformed. And so with the fourth industrial revolution as the scope and content of economic production and jobs are being transformed, the kinds of human capital required are also likely to be transformed. When we look at revolutionary changes in technology on jobs, we see a threefold impact. First, some jobs are lost as machines replace human beings. So for instance, when equipment such as tractors came, uh, they replaced many agricultural tasks that required manual labor in agriculture before. Secondly, many jobs continue, but need new skills for their full execution. So as an example, uh, university academics like yourselves today routinely use computers and software relevant for your ac academic disciplines. Earlier generations of academics used pen and paper and blackboards and chalk for the same tasks. So I recall my own days as a student in Colombo University and also as a probationary lecturer when I started. Uh, in the economics department at that time, uh, we basically had as equipment, one electronic typewriter and one manual typewriter. That was all. And also when I walk around the universities, including parts of the science faculty, we saw that much of the teaching was really done without the kinds of equipment and technology 
that the current generation of academics now have. The productivity of jobs increases with the application of technology. So I am sure that you all now as academics can do a lot in terms of your teaching and your research that could not be done if you didn't have access to computers, if you didn't have access to the internet, and if you didn't have access to the kinds of sophisticated equipment that are now available in the universities. Thirdly, with the transformation of technology, new jobs are created. So for instance, there are many jobs linked with modern internet-based services that did not exist until late in the computer era. There are jobs, for example, thrown up by social media that didn't exist even at the, at the dawn of the 21st century, but which are now routinely and widely available in countries around the world. And among these, the transformation of jobs requiring new skills, new human capital, is usually the most common feature of economies. This is followed by the creation of new jobs, and then the, also the loss of certain old jobs with obsolete skills. So just as an example, uh, with computers and with a generation that is computer literate, the kinds of jobs that were done by stenographers and shorthand typists disappeared because no longer did we have people at workplaces dictating to stenographers and shorthand typists who would then go type up what was described, what was dictated, come back, show the typed output with the, with the dictation and then correct that, go back, type it up again and come. Instead, we have people who are directly typing using word processing skills into computers and that's much more efficient and productive than the old uh, stenography typewriting skill. So this is just an example, but there are many others. Then human capital production and accumulation needs to be continually transformed to meet the changes in skill needs. So the demand for advanced cognitive and socio-emotional skills is increasing, while the demand for less advanced skills that can be readily automated is decreasing. So we saw that in earlier industrial revolutions, manual labor was replaced by machinery, by equipment. But now what we are seeing in the era of the third industrial revolution and the fourth industrial revolution is that even intellectual skills, cognitive skills, are, are, are some types of cognitive skills, routine cognitive skills are being replaced by machinery by, or by software, by technology. And so it's really the advanced cognitive and socio-emotional skills that are required. And this requires adaptation in curricula, both in schools and in universities, in teaching and learning, and in assessment across education systems. Also, disruptive change is predicted to transform the skills needed in future careers and multiple times in the working life of an individual. So if we take the working life of an individual as roughly say 30 to 40 years, the skills required are likely to be transformed more than once, more than twice over the 30, 40 year period. And I'm sure many of you who are university academics and are perhaps in your 50s and 60s have seen this also in your own working lives compared to the time when you were young probationary lecturers in your 20s. And education and training systems need to support children, youth, and adults to make these changes, especially in universities. Technological development is skills-based, and so investing more in human capital has higher returns, and now more than ever before in history. So in the early days of human capital theory, 
uh, what economists estimated was that the highest returns, the highest investment benefits came to investing in primary education. That was in an era when countries had largely illiterate populations, populations that were to a great extent barely able to read and write, or where only a small percentage of the population could read and write. But over time now with universal primary education and, and very little illiteracy, what we are seeing with the kinds of technology that are, that are, that are available around the world and a, kinds of equipment is that the highest economic benefits, the highest rates of return are to higher education. And we have seen this from about 1985 onwards and the returns to higher education keep increasing. So over the last 35 years or so, 36 years or so, the returns to higher education have been the highest among different levels of education and the gap between higher education and other levels has been rising. This process has accelerated with the advent of the fourth industrial revolution. Investment in human capital is a necessity now for productive engagement with what is the global knowledge economy. What we are also seeing is that traditional education systems are struggling to produce the new skills needed. The focus of education systems in the past and on which we have, of course, built has been based mainly on intelligence or initial cognitive ability and cognitive skills. But these skills are not alone adequate in the era of the fourth industrial revolution. The focus of education systems needs, needs to be broadened and widened beyond intelligence as an education input and beyond cognitive skills as an education outcome. Fortunately, we also see that there is a lot of research and policy on these areas and there is an advancement of knowledge in these areas, uh, especially over the last 10 years or so. Personality traits determine academic performance and skill formation. So what we call the big five personality traits in, in psychology, openness to experience, conscientiousness or perseverance, extraversion, agreeableness, and emotional stability matter for success in school, in university, and in the job market. For instance, research in labor economic, economics or in the labor markets show us that conscientiousness, that is conscientiousness or perseverance, matters as much as intelligence for employment outcomes. Further, openness to experience is very important for innovation. Socio-emotional skills are analogous or similar to personality traits, but with emphasis on malleability. Socio-emotional skills are important determinants of economic outcomes. They have an indirect effect through cognitive skills on job performance. They also have a direct effect on earnings, for example, through openness and conscientiousness. Both con cognitive and socio-emotional skills contribute to productivity. What you know, for instance, matters for creativity and cognitive skills are important, but socio-emotional skills also matter as shown in repeated labor market studies. We also see that education systems can promote socio-emotional skills. And there are several dimensions which are key for a high-performing education system. So we see that first good quality early childhood education is vital. Uh, brain development is at its most rapid when children are very small. And about 80% of brain development has been completed when uh, children have completed the early childhood years. So that period is, is of central importance for, for stimulus. Uh, the foundations of personality are, and learning are laid in the early years. The foundations of personality seem to be laid by about the time a child is about four years old. 
Second, school systems need to be transformed to promote both cognitive learning and socio-emotional skills. This requires fresh approaches to curricula, to teaching and learning and assessment. Third, it is important to have a well-timed and effective vocational training and technical education system. Fourthly, a high quality and widely accessible higher education system is needed. So this is where universities are important. And fifthly and finally, these elements of education need to construct an efficient and productive lifelong learning system. So again, universities are important for lifelong learning so that a person who's an adult can come back to university, not just once, but multiple times to improve their skills and their human capital. Economic policies can promote the creative use of all forms of human capital. So a pro-market economic environment is needed as it produces a variety and diversity of opportunities. A market-friendly environment also creates space and freedom and rewards for innovation. Policies that stifle markets, conversely, hamper the productive use of skills. A vital component of a pro-market economic environment is openness to international trade with free cross-border flows of goods and ideas. And this in turn provides exposure to new thinking and the creation of new opportunities. This is something that seems to be uh, still not very well understood in Sri Lankan society and in much of the Sri Lankan public discourse. So when we uh, read, for example, the newspapers, listen to discussions on the TV or on radio, there are a large number of criticisms of what is called uh, market economies, open economies, and so on. But really, Unless an economy is open and pro-market, we, we, we do not see prosperity, economic development, and growth. And we, we see this in our own experience in Sri Lanka. So Sri Lanka has had two waves of economic growth. The first was in the middle of the 19th century, which laid the foundations of the plantation economy of tea, of rubber, and coconut as export products. And much of Sri Lanka's economic prosperity in the 19th century and the early parts of the 20th century uh, depended on these plantation crops, on, on tea, on rubber, on coconut. Around 1950, 30% of Sri Lanka's economy came from the plantation sector. And this was only possible because we could export, because markets were open, and we benefited from exports. The second period of prosperity in Sri Lanka really came from 1977 onwards when our economy was open and we could again trade widely in, in, in cross-border uh, economic production. So for instance, the foundation of our industrial uh, uh, base in Sri Lanka with textiles and garments took off in the late 1970s and the 1980s. Uh, this was helped by what was called the multi-fiber agreement and the common agreement on uh, textiles and, and garments that existed worldwide at that time under the GATT rules, the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs. Uh, and some of you may remember, some of us in this discussion may remember how in the 1980s, in the late 70s, early 80s, the Korean companies started coming into Sri Lanka to set up, in, uh, set up industrial plants in textiles and garments to exploit Sri Lanka's uh, Sri Lanka's quota into international markets. And that really laid the platform for the industries that we now have. Our largest export earner now is, is uh, textiles and garments. And also some other kinds of uh, industrial products that we expose. And that happened roughly from during the 1980s. And that was when the platform was laid. So this again depended on open markets, global trade, international trade, and our ability to trade well in global markets in some products. But these are also obvious if you think of a university. Because if you think of universities and particularly the sciences, which are universal, uh, 
you can't really engage in science unless you're able to access and tap scientific knowledge, not only in Sri Lanka, but around the world. So if there are advances in knowledge, in chemistry, in physics, in uh, biology, in all the branches of the sciences, and you are not able to keep up with those advances in knowledge and reflect those in your teaching and research, basically you get cut off from uh, the modern world of knowledge. So that openness to the rest of the world is vital for universities, especially in the sciences, but also of course in other disciplines. And then also uh, the same holds not only for ideas, trade in ideas, but also trade in intellectual products, but also physical products. So these are important, and I would be interested to hear what you all as scientists have to say about this during the period of your period of our, of our discussion after the, this talk is over. Just on this matter, since it's very important for our, for our economy, I also have a couple of stories on this. So we know that in the period of the middle 1950s and early 1960s, and again in the early 1970s, uh, Sri Lanka practiced what is called import substitution, not export-led growth. And with import substitution, we actually started lagging behind other countries uh, who, who actually were behind us in an earlier period. So for example, when we take countries like Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, all these countries were behind Sri Lanka in terms of their economies. Uh, at the end of the Second World War, of course, Singapore became a country only much later, but when it became a country, it lagged behind Sri Lanka. But in periods of import substitution, we actually fell behind the economies of these more open trading countries which practiced export-led growth. And eventually we now are, of course, way behind the industrial and knowledge-based services of these countries. I re remember reading some of the economic planning that was done in the 1950s, early 60s, and, and early 70s, and some of the economic thinking of that time. Uh, and also talking to some of the economists the earlier generation of economists, people who were, say, our parents' generation, uh, and who were actually responsible for this work. And one of the things that I distinctly remember hearing from these economists was that in the 1950s, the whole world was stifling international trade, stifling the cross-border flow of goods and ideas. And so, Sri Lanka had little option but to turn to industrial production based on, uh, based on import substitution policies. There were two problems that they faced at that time. One, there were strong trade restrictions in export markets, even in developed countries. Uh, even the, uh, the developed countries of, uh, of Europe, particularly, but also North America and Australia, New Zealand, had high tariff barriers and quantitative restrictions, tariff barriers and quotas on exports into their markets. Partly this was a reflection of um, wrong policies that had been put in place in the 1930s during the Great Depression. And partly this was a reflection of the quotas that had to come during the Second World War in the, in the period between 1939 and 1945. But these quotas and tariffs continued into the 1950s. And it was hard for Sri Lanka to enter these markets. But it was another constraint that was even more binding. In Sri Lanka at that time, our local industries didn't have the knowledge, the skills, the know-how to produce sophisticated industrial products that could enter into European markets or could enter into the North American market or to Australia, New Zealand. We could export primary products, tea, for instance, coconut, rubber, and rubber -based, some rubber-based products, but uh, we couldn't really export into these European markets or developed country markets. 
because we didn't have the knowledge and skills at that time in our local economy. So it was really after 1977 and the opening of the economy that we saw a flow of ideas, of skills, of knowledge from developed countries into Sri Lanka, which enabled us to industrialize and export into those overseas markets, which we have done relatively successfully in certain areas such as textiles and garments, where we export into the most sophisticated global economies because we have that knowledge and skills. We also have a strong IT services industry, which is based on IT knowledge produced, of course, in our own universities, including the University of Colombo. So these are the plus points of pro-market, open market economies. But a point little understood, unfortunately, in our popular discourse. Finally, the broad ethical framework of society also needs to be favorable to innovation and development. And here we see that democracy is of vital importance for economic prosperity. Democracy promotes innovation and while authoritarianism suffocates innovation. And we see this when we compare countries such as North Korea and South Korea, or countries in Western Europe and countries in Eastern Europe. So if we take just two examples, which are excellent natural experiments, what we economists call natural experiments, uh, because they control for a number of factors which otherwise are hard to replicate in society. So if you take the two Germanys, uh, what used to be called West Germany and East Germany, uh, where the distinction took place after the Second World War, uh, where West Germany was the part that was occupied when the Second World War was ending by American and uh, British and European and French forces. And East Germany was the part that was occupied by Russian armed forces. And the split took place between West Germany and East Germany. We had an excellent natural ex experiment because these were the same people, the same German people. They had the same language. They had the same cultural inheritance and the same pre-Second World War or even Second World War experience. So that was two countries now, West Germany and East Germany, but with the same people and the same, if you like, society and culture. And the other similar case was the, was, was the two Koreas. So South Korea and North Korea. Uh, North Korea practicing authoritarianism and communism. South Korea practicing early on some authoritarianism, but later on turning into a democracy and also practicing open market policies. West Germany practicing democracy and open market policies. East Germany practicing authoritarianism and communism. And what we saw over the period of the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and 80s uh, was that the democracies and the open market economies way outperformed the communist dictatorships. So West Germany way outperformed East Germany to the extent that the East Germans themselves in the late 1980s uh, overthrew their East German regime and joined with West Germany. Right? The fall of the Berlin Wall in the late 1980s was part of the East German revolution, overthrowing their own communist dictator rulers. Uh, this has not happened in Korea, but we see of course that South Korea has way outperformed North Korea in terms of economic prosperity and the quality of life. Around 1950, North Korea was actually wealthier and had a larger population than South Korea. South Korea overtook North Korea in the early 1960s in terms of per capita income. By 1961, 62, 63, South Korea had outperformed North Korea so much over the preceding 10 years that they became much wealthier. Then, of course, the gap has continued. So we see in these two very good examples, but also many other examples, that democratic market-oriented economies outperform uh, authoritarian regimes that stifle markets. We also see that ethical teams are more productive than unethical groups. Uh, the social capital provided by shared values, 
norms and good and codes of good conduct are necessary to underpin a well functioning economy based on productive and hu innovative human capital so this is a is a broad range of ideas and i would like to pose this these as challenges to you in the university of colombo although the, the science faculties are represented here they, these are challenges for the science faculty but also for other faculties how will the university adapt to the fourth industrial revolution and start producing the knowledge and skills that will be required in uh, future when machinery can do much of the work that is currently being done by uh, human beings by educated human beings so we hear for example that jobs like uh, the radiologist job hopefully interest to you in the science faculty and the medical faculty or jobs like the accountant job are now disappearing because there is machinery and equipment that can do these better or software that can do these be jobs better than human beings and this will happen increasingly with other kinds of intellectual jobs but also how can we promote a better understanding of uh, of economic production of economic prosperity of the importance of democracy in in our population as a whole because it's really the universities that promote this type of understanding in countries even though it might take a generations left so these are some ideas that i proposed and i would like to see very much or hear very much in the discussion uh, what you will what the the scientists at colombo university have to say on these areas so thank you very much and over to you Uh, and I hope you will stay with us for the panel discussion because I'm sure that uh, a lot of the questions that may come to us will be addressed to you. I would now like to take the opportunity to introduce the rest of the panel. So uh, starting on my immediate right is, of course, uh, Professor Chandrika Vijayaratna, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Colombo. And I'd like to point out that she's not only here as vice chancellor, but she's a professional in the medical field in her own right and ha has expertise to contribute. Um, on this end of the table is uh, the Dean of the Faculty of Science, Professor Upul Sonadara, who uh, of course is more than just a dean. He's one of the leading researchers in physics in this country. I think it's perhaps a little premature of me to say this, but I've mentioned anyway that uh, he has been nominated for a lifetime award by the Sri Lanka Association for the Advancement of Science, which will be uh, uh, given to him next month. Then <laughs> uh, on the other end of the table, we have uh, Professor Preeti Udagama, uh, a long-term colleague of mine. We were undergraduates together at one time, I think, Preeti. Uh, she is, uh, uh, in addition to being the head of uh, zoology right now, uh, she is also uh, a biotechnologist, and that's her area of expertise. And seated next to her uh, is uh, a very important member of this panel, I think, Dr. Ruan Veerasinghe of the University of Colombo School of Computing. Uh, and he's ex an expert in just about anything that has to do with computers, including artificial intelligence, which uh, played a role in uh, Dr. Atrupana's talk. Uh, lastly, I would like to acknowledge on my immediate left, Dr. Iroja Caldera, the coordinator of this event, uh, who will uh, help me keep abreast of any uh, questions that may come from the online participants. So with those introductions out of the way, uh, let's proceed to the panel discussion. And the way I want to do it is to ask each panelist in turn, in the order in which I introduce them, 
uh, to speak briefly uh, in which they will relate their area of expertise or in the case of the vice chancellor, her experience as uh, uh, an educator, uh, an, edu an educational administrator. Uh, they will relate that, that aspect of, uh, of their expertise to what Dr. Atrupan has already said to see if there's a connection between these. And I will give each person a few minutes in which to do this. Uh, and then we will take questions from the audience, or for that matter, even questions from uh, the members of the panel to each other. So with that, can I turn the floor to uh, the Vice Chancellor. Thank you very much uh, for putting me on the hot seat. As it were. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, Dr. Atrupana, for that very, very stimulating and thought-provoking uh, overview, which I believe every policymaker and planner uh, involved not only in education but beyond have to truly give uh, their attention. And uh, I really would like to request, if I don't, if you don't mind, Dean and everyone, to try and uh, make a synopsis of this, not only in English but also in the vernacular, so that, and we discuss it at, you know, first within the university, and then we could even take it further with our hierarchy. In terms of the pure aspect of education, I think. Sri Lanka has achieved a lot, but also had, have had missed opportunities. And each one of those aspects which Dr. Atirupan addressed so eloquently was, uh, uh, I realized we have had that many missed opportunities when we could have done much better. And I think still it's not too late. So in that respect, uh, we had the Honorable Minister here for the launch of the SPAN. And I was very heartened to note that he said it actually in a very, uh, very, uh, very honest manner and a committed manner to say that he truly respects academic autonomy. I mean, I think that spoke a lot, and uh, we must think positively. So, one aspect about uh, what where we sort of get extremely worried about how we have failed or uh, have these missed opportunities is we will always kind of grumble, permit me to use that word, about that we do not have this or we do not have that, including money, funds, which I think is the way I see it, uh, maybe personality, like what he said, is I would think positively and not and actually attributed to mental poverty rather than actually financial poverty. Put me right, uh, Dr. Atrupana, because I'm not an economist, so I stand to be corrected. I also agree with you that everyone wants a job and security. Uh, from wherever we are born, from wherever we, we go, when we come for education, we think of that outcome. And I don't know whether we as an educator whether we give that the due place and prominence when we plan our uh, study courses to that, for that matter, uh, as to how we do the teaching, learning, and assessment. And that is something that we really need to, you know, we, have a, we are all the time running we have multi to multitask, and we have quality assurance, I don't know where Professor Nirmali is, but looming uh, all around. And one aspect about quality assurance, we no doubt, just like quality of life, we need quality of education. We need to be appreciated that we can't put corporate management principles to education directly. It can be stifled, particularly about metrics and auditors. But at the same time, auditing is important. So you need to strike that balance with what I see having now been in this hot seat for about two and a half years. I mean, we need to have ethical, strong ethical principles and civic mindedness, which is missing in our 
from early childhood to school education, we, we have missed that opportunity. We have missed civic education, which in these educational transformations we have been kept on talking about. And I totally agree about early childhood learning and all those, but that level of patriotism. Because if we look at the fact that we got free education, I'm sure you economists can uh, talk about it in more detail. What about, have we ever thought about the loss of human capital for our own country's development? I mean, I know very well that the science faculty has had a wonderful group of alumni, but what fraction of it remains here to do good? And now with the digitization, whether we can have a reverse flow and an enabling environment, a greater support, not money, I'm not talking about money, but about human capital. And I think I'll stop here. Thank you, Vice Chancellor. Uh, there were many things that you said that struck a note with me. One of them was the fact that we can overdo uh, quality control and get carried away with the paperwork and uh, find us having less time to do uh, the important stuff. Uh, I remember that very well from my own time here. Uh, let's now move on to uh, Professor Upulso Nadara. I've already introduced him, so I don't need to say anything more about him. Upul, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, uh, Ranil. Uh, I think uh, when I uh, think about what uh, Dr. Atrupana talked about, uh, I thought I will focus on the curriculum, uh, especially science curriculum, and maybe funding. So uh, when I go back to maybe even uh, uh, 80s or before that, uh, up to about 2000, uh, I can see that uh, we had a very rigid curriculum. So we had the general degree program, and then uh, those, who, uh, those who did well in a certain subject, we selected them to do uh, what we call specialized degrees, four-year programs. But uh, when you look at uh, four-year programs, actually we were, uh, most of them went abroad to do higher studies because uh, we were catering uh, uh, not to the, uh, uh, not uh, most of them, they didn't stay in Sri Lanka because the opportunities were available outside. And also the, uh, the things we taught, actually they could go and do higher studies. So by some, most of us uh, seated in this table, maybe except for a few exceptions, uh, we, uh, we got the benefit from that system. But uh, I think uh, science faculty, when I think about maybe after early 2000 onward, um, we had a reform. I think uh, I personally believe that reform was a very good uh, decision we have taken. So the, uh, instead of uh, no, not only having this uh, specialization or skills uh, 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 that is catering only for the outside, we thought we will bring uh, another set of four-year degrees which are more uh, uh, catering to the industry. So. Now, of course, uh, we have come to a stage where we have 30-odd 30, 30 specializations, and some of the students, uh, they do not want to do uh, even uh, uh, those traditional four-year degrees. Now, they are selecting, op opting to do the industrial uh, 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 base specialization. That is because the job opportunities are available here. So I think uh, when you look at the other science faculties in uh, Sri Lanka, I don't think they, ha they have expanded as much as we have. Maybe they have a couple of uh, specialization, uh, specializations, but I think we made a right decision at that point. Of course, uh, Dr. Adrupane was talking about the uh, jobs in the future. Now, as a faculty of science, we cannot think uh, uh, future. I, do, I also do not know what jobs we will have in the future. So at the moment, we may be looking at maybe five, 10 years or even lesser time, maybe five years, what jobs are available, and uh, also current jobs, and that's, that's the training or the skills we are imparting to our students. But maybe it is time that uh, we need to think about a little bit beyond that, so that we are ready for uh, uh, training uh, uh, students to uh, uh, future jobs as well. So, that, I mean, especially when you look at the faculty, uh, we have come across few uh, changes, now, uh, I see that data science, for example, uh, we have a center for data science. 
So, and uh, also we are looking at uh, establishing several other centers. We, are, we want to uh, have uh, these centers uh, cater into cross-cutting areas rather than one uh, uh, maybe subject or two. Uh, we need to look at how we can uh, have multidisciplinary approach in uh, those centers as well. Then uh, if I uh, uh, talk about research, uh, basically we see that uh, under early days, now research funding is available, but maybe because of economic conditions, uh, more and more government pressure is uh, there for us to uh, do uh, research that you can commercialize. But I personally think that uh, we need to maintain balance between the two. You need to do fundamental research, and of course you need to do applied research. So applied research that you can actually cater to the uh, maybe producing a product at the end. Um, it's a long way because you have to, even if you patent maybe, uh, if you have 100 patents, most probably maybe you can market uh, uh, three or four only. So it's a battle in that area. But uh, when you look at fundamental research is important, I believe Dr. Atrupana touched that also because the new knowledge you generate through fundamental research. So it's very important for us to uh, have people uh, studying in those areas as well. So let me stop uh, uh, that brief uh, summary there and uh, uh, let others express their ideas. Thank you. Thanks, Supu. Uh, you made a lot of points which I'm sure will elicit questions from the audience at some point. But before we get to that, let me uh, hand the floor over to Preeti. So Professor Dugama will uh, say a few words. Thank you. Thank you, Abby, and thank you for inviting me to talk about one of my favorite subjects. So biotechnology is multifaceted, is a multifaceted science and is inherently a multidisciplinary. So if I just very briefly mention the different areas of biotech, so medical biotech entails, you know, the COVID vaccines, the RNA vaccines that we took, all the diagnostics, the antibodies, uh, testing, and et cetera, et cetera. You know, I don't have time, so I can't go into my favorite top subject, so there's environment science, um, uh, biotech, industrial, aquatic, um, agricultural, nutrition, and the latest additions are bioinformatics, if you want, and um, um, bioinformatics, nanobiotechnology, uh, then, so what I'm trying to show it is that, you know, this is a truly multifaceted science. And uh, so if I move on to the human capital, um, next. I mean, we have plenty of trained human capital in this country in biotechnology. You people might be surprised. So when we did an audit of how many uh, researchers in this faculty are trained in biotechnology, I'm talking PhDs here. Uh, there were 51 out of the 100 odd PhDs who are also encompassing all seven departments. So we have now, Madam Vice Chancellor, uh, formed a team and uh, we are in the process of establishing a transdisciplinary biotech research center and we will be, you know, it's going to be truly multidisciplinary and what we want to do is to take, uh, sounds crude, but research to ru rupees, madam, because biotech, uh, you know, entails, if you do correct biotech, you, it entails coming up with in, uh, inventions, innovations, products, services, to upgrade humanity and the environment. So, um, you know, and it, it's sad because we have biotechnology in our biology A-level syllabus. We have numerous, I think if I give you the numbers very quickly, there are about 17 special degrees based in biotechnology in the state university system. This is without the private sector, I'm talking. And then uh, there are the, there are at least 15 uh, universities offering biotechnology as a course. We will be doing that very soon. Uh, we are lagging behind, perhaps. The, there are seven MSCs offered by uh, Colombo and Peradenia uh, in biotech, and so on and so on. And we have numerous MPhils and PhDs being awarded every year in this vast area of biotechnology. So some pe actually, it's sometimes unfortunate, you know, uh, to say that people don't even know that they're working in the field of biotech because this is so vast, you know? I mean, this may sound amusing, but it is the truth. 
So, if, so okay, so we have this human capital. We have this trained human capital. So then why are we lagging behind this, the biotech? You know, why are we not turning this research into rupees? Uh, the reason is, I think, primarily, this is my personal feeling, is that all these trained young minds, clever people, skilled people, I don't know about attitudes, though, um, they have no jobs in this field, in this country, except for a very few research institutes, perhaps a few university positions. Uh, so the cream of them, it's brain drain. And... Um, so our biotech industry, unfortunately, is at a very infant stage, a very, very infant stage, a, a, pre, a preliminary stage, I would say. But this, again, I'm going to emphasize is research to rupees and economic sustainability through science. And uh, if we take the global market, the global biotech market, it was worth 725 billion US dollars in 2020. It is projected to grow at 15% annually for the next seven years. With COVID, it might be a little less. But uh, if you take our neighboring country, India, their biotech industry is booming. Uh, their uh, export market is worth, this was in 2013, mind you, their export market was 2 billion US dollars. The internal market, the domestic market was 1.9 billion uh, US dollars. So what are we doing? Right. And also, just one more minute, we are a biodiversity hotspot, Sri Lanka, out of, out of the 25 we are one. So we have enough of terrestrial biodiversity, we have enough of uh, marine um, biodiversity to come up with products and services for humanity. But we, that all that is untouched, untapped. And so, but we have uh, the chance to leapfrog. Uh, state patronage is, of course, mandatory, I'm sorry to say this. Also, our industry must be aware, because even, madam, even though we come up with uh, inventions, they are not ready to take it forward, because there's nobody, you know, they don't understand this whole concept of biotech. Maybe, I don't know. So, I, before I get too uh, passionate, just one last word. Uh, Sri Lanka, we have a biotech policy, which was released uh, in 2010, so it's 11 years old. We have a beautiful biotech strategy on paper, gathering dust. So that is the current scenario. So I, I, I hope that Dr. Sukhpana, that you will answer my question of, you know, Koa Wadi, from where, from here to where. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Preeti. I do appreciate your passion. I glimpsed it two years ago when you were the general president of the Sri Lanka Association for the Advancement of Science and you conducted all those workshops on biotechnology in every province in the country. I still remember that. So with that, I will move on to our last panelist, Dr. Ruan Veerasinghe, who I think um, has some very valuable insights on subjects that Dr. Atrupan has touched upon already. Ruan. Thank you. Uh, thank you, R.D. So yeah, I think uh, Harsha threw out so many ideas that uh, it's a bit hard to know where to pick, which ones to pick. Uh, one of the things, of course, was obviously the fourth industrial revolution. So the one that I thought I should talk was that. But today, after listening to him, I'm going to look at two other things he, he raised. One of them is, you know, some of these things are getting replaced by machines. And our university programs will also be uh, subject to that. Uh, one place, I think Colombo University is in a, in a unique position to avoid that, is that we have all the faculties we can think of, right? but we are not using it. We are not using the fact that we have all these faculties to do real multidisciplinary work. Uh, I heard that the first session, there was some discussion about this, and I think that's where we uh, need to focus. I mean, uh, when I say multidisciplinary, uh, uh, by the way, there, there are a lot of technology in this te technical terminology, multidisciplinary, cross-disciplinary, interdisciplinary, and so on. But um, we do many things. We, we say we are doing some cross-disciplinary work, but actually from within our discipline. Uh, 
they are not truly cross disciplinary. So, uh, in my oh. research career, all, all the areas I got involved are cross disciplinary. So, uh, I started with linguistics. So, how, how do I make the computer uh, kind of process language? Um, so, computational linguistics. And then I uh, got on to bioinformatics. You know, how, how do we help biologists to kind of um, do uh, some directed research instead of kind of, um, you know, doing a lot of wet lab work without uh, really knowing where we are uh, searching. And then most recently, I'm looking at something in the area of uh, complex adaptive systems and particularly applied to social sciences because uh, you know, and, and in all these, the domain expert is not us. It's uh, the, the biologists or the social scientists or you know whoever uh, who is doing this work, right? And, and that's where it's hard to break through our silos, right? So we, we do research, we do this research, staying and so so uh, IBM BB for instance does bioinformatics, right? Uh, we do bioinformatics at the UCSC, and then uh, Preeti does bioinformatics. So. Uh, but it's, it has been really hard to bring these together. And this is something that we can actually leverage going forward. The second thing I want to um, uh, take up from what Harsha said is, of course, uh, uh, he talked about the socio-emotional aspect. And you know, all these things we talk about, and, and Preeti was saying that, you know, sometimes we are talking so many, about so many, uh, you know, abstract things. Right. When it comes socio-emotional skills, do our students have the environment for a healthy socio-emotional skill? You know where I'm going with this, right? I consider that in a few years' time, I'm going to retire, and one of my biggest failures has been not being able to deal with the ragging situation in the university system, right? Uh, how can we have that freedom? The Harsha was talking about the freedom to think, to do stuff, right? But our students, you know, when they come in, and now it's, it, it's got worse because it doesn't finish in the first semester, first term, or whatever. It, it keeps going, right? And this, I think, partly we are to blame because we expect students to stand. I mean, I, of course, I tell them from the first year. Now, those days, I only told my honor student. But now I tell from the first year, don't stand when I come, right? And it, it really is a, a big uh, problem for them, right? So I actually walk out again, and then again I come in, right? I think we have to do this. I, I, was, I was very happy to see uh, uh, one politician saying, why are you standing for us? He said, I was really, you know, so as long as we are in this kind of, uh, you know, this, this rigid, hierarchical structure, I don't think we can uh, get over this. So um, uh, I, I, was in, uh, uh, I had to chair a thing that set up the so-called uh, Vidya Peter, you know what is it? These are teacher training colleges, right? And this was particularly in Ruanpura, uh, the, the one dedicated to IT. So we went and you know, did all this. And, and then they said, okay, now we have to get the students. How are the students coming? Full white, uh, uh, I had here, Sarong. And I said, can we at least have a Friday where they can wear anything? Uh, because how do you start thinking, uh, you know, in a free way when you come dressed like that and the teacher, you worship the teacher and you know, all that. I'm, I, I'm, I'm not against, you know, uh, our traditions and all that. I think they have a place. But I, I mean, I, with parents, they have a really important place, and, and teachers also, but not, you know, I know there are some people who stand up when you, we go to class, but they are thinking, oh, this is a boring lecture, or, or you know, I wish the teacher didn't come, you know, so that's the respect, you know, the respect is in the mind, not in just standing up, you know, they may be cursing us when they're standing up. Uh, so, so I just wanted to talk about these two aspects, but uh, I mean, I hope there'll be discussion about the fourth industrial revolution and other topics uh, from the audience.
Thank you, Ruan. Uh, so now we will, uh, now that each panelist has uh, had his or her say, uh, I will, actually, I would like to start by giving the panelists an opportunity to respond to one another if uh, any of them have anything to say in response to what they've already heard from their fellow panelists. respond to all of you really uh, you know there are minor minor relatively minor correctable issues within our domain in Kamiugan but one of the biggest challenges is really to change our educational system so that our inputs into the university can be more for higher learning more ready for higher learning self-reliance learning, learning rather than teaching. Because, you know, making these syllabi and uh, doing timetabling and is not really, you know, in keeping, that is not the priority. It's to encourage the students to learn, think for themselves. Uh, and in that respect, because we are at a research conference, you know, we have this orientation course, which we teach English, uh, address ragging, sexual harassment, and so on. But we, I think somewhere down the line, uh, you know, in medicine, we, we know we had to change the medical curriculum into a social basis of medicine. That's why we had behavioral science. But though we did that, still psychologically, everybody wants to re, re, uh, relocate their lectures to a new system. Whereas, you know, it's at the bedside or in the community that you actually see the social social basis of medicine and help them, help giving. So in that context, what I would urge the university uh, community of academics and faculty is to have at the, at the outset a, a discussion with the students or give them time and space to think of uh, self-reliance learning. Technology is so conducive to that. And uh, also, more than, you know, I know we need to know the language of English, but that is not the priority alone. And also to put them in the deep end, let them read some good research. And then work it out through themselves as to how, uh, you know, how you really go for scientific discovery. That's what I would like to say. Actually, what you uh, just said uh, takes us very nicely to the first question which I would now like to pose to you before I <laughs> pose it to some of the others. And this question is from uh, one of my own colleagues, Professor Rohini de Silva. And the question is a very simple one. How would you change the present education system to face future jobs or challenges? Now, I, we, we heard in, in sort of broad outline how you would do it, but I was wondering, Madam Vice Chancellor, whether you have any specifics in mind, and particularly specifics referring to uh, something you raised right at the beginning about people coming who come into the university. So uh, I guess any changes we make would have to involve the secondary educational system as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, no, I, I think this is doable, and that is where, uh, you know, when we went into the shutdown, with the first shutdown, Coursera came forward. And I, I know you people in digital uh, learning were familiar, or in mathematics and so on, but Coursera was a new feature to many other study <coughs> courses within the university ecosystem. And I, I felt that, you know, even in the cyber campus, uh, you realize that there are so many learning material and uh, provisions available on the net, which is free of charge. And that has been, those have been developed not only by teachers, by the industry and the receivers of the graduates. And that is where we need to develop for the Rohini, that link and get it more into experiential learning, not teaching. Let me pose the same question to, uh, to Professor Sonnadara. Uh, Upul, 
would you, what changes would you like to see in the present educational system? And, and particularly, I would like you to address, if you can, uh, changes to the secondary school system uh, to make the people who come into the university more prepared for university education. Uh, <laughs> so I know it's a tough question. Yeah, it's a tough question. Uh, uh, one thing I would say that um, if I directly take what uh, Rohini uh, asked, of course the future, at the moment we do not know the future. For example, nobody anticipated that we would be using the Zoom technology uh, for uh, remo uh, remote communication this level. But indications are there often that uh, when we realize there is an issue, so that if we can take uh, early intervention, you can actually develop. For example, uh, when I uh, talk about uh, we were having a rigid system and we were catering to only those who specialized to go abroad. I mean, the indication was there, but for many years we didn't do anything. But only later in the years we took a decision. Uh, I believe that was the right decision. So sometimes the, when you look at the, uh, the f future, you see that uh, what Harsha talked about, uh, more smart systems are being developed or data science is uh, used to uh, maybe uh, uh, analyze the data and uh, see patterns and all that. So uh, then the, uh, we understand that the, uh, uh, even economics, you need mathematics. So whether we need to bring certain degrees, and now I know maths department, they have already introduced uh, uh, financial mathematics degree, which is highly popular degree. Uh, there's a big demand for that. So sometimes, actually, we ourselves need to look at where the opportunities are and then start thinking about it. So the school system, if you look at, uh, of course, the sometimes I think uh, even the school educators, we need to uh, change their mindset. Uh, we discussed the other day that uh, World Bank, uh, I don't know whether Harsha can remember, we had a workshop and uh, then uh, we were, at uh, that time we were trying to promote mathematics teaching at school level. Then uh, one of the audience, uh, uh, somebody got up and said that, uh, why we say that, uh, now all level, if you look at, large number of students are failing mathematics, that time. And uh, because everybody was sitting for one particular paper. So uh, those who wanted to go uh, and do arts also, they had to sit for the same paper. So uh, that time, uh, one, one of the directors got up and uh, he said, uh, why we say that uh, they do not know mathematics, a child can go to the shop and uh, buy the things for that day and bring the correct change with the item. So uh, the question is that he, he totally misunderstood what we were discussing, that uh, we are not trying to teach mathematics just for somebody to go to the shop and come back. We are trying to teach mathematics to cater to people the skills that they need for the future. So the, that those extra skills are needed. So uh, if you are training somebody to teach mathematics just to go to the shop and come back, then of course the whole point is missing. So sometimes I think the school level, not only the teachers, but even the, uh, the higher level administrator, they need to understand uh, uh, where the education system is going. So the, for me, of course, the uh, maths is an important component, and I believe all level, they have brought the intervention now. So I think it is working out because the, uh, I can't 100% say, but, uh, uh, but I believe that those who wanted to do uh, arts and, arts and uh, other subjects, uh, there's a, now uh, two papers are available, so they have uh, somehow uh, addressed that problem, so that's why we don't hear very much uh, uh, that problem in papers. Otherwise, normally you hear it in the papers that there are huge problems. So the, uh, but the university, those who wanted to uh, come to the university, uh, A-level is a uh, very uh, tough exam. Uh, our main problem is that uh, students are trained uh, only to uh, pass the A-level to come to the exam in the sense that they will try to do all the past papers available and uh, uh, so th somehow they are passing the A-level, but when they come here, we see that they are not thinkers. They can't, uh, if you change something, they can't actually uh, answer. So the, uh, for example, if the A-level paper style is changed, so many people will complain. That is because they are trained to think in a certain way, and the tuition culture is one of the problems. I'm not telling that uh, tuitions are not helping, but I'm telling 
but yeah, uh, uh, we have to th think about uh, A-level, maybe A-level qualification as one, and the university entrance exam uh, entrance as something else. So uh, I do not know exact answer, RD, but uh, uh, I think uh, we need to have a, a wider dialogue for these kind of things. Thanks, Supu. Uh, I'd like to move on to the next question, which I think is appropriately directed at uh, at Ruan. Right, to read it out, it's a rather long question. Digitization, AI, and computer technology nowadays have become essential. However, in my view, the way our brain works when acquiring knowledge is a central matter in education. Perception of knowledge is different when writing notes, reading a book, reading online, etc. I would like to know your expert opinion on how the cognitive processes are affected by computer technology. Yeah, I, I think um, the, you know, in a lot of movies, they show that, you know, there is this thing that's out there and that's like working against us, right? We, we are humans and those are machines and we should resist that. I mean, and, and most of the movies that are popular, you know, show that, you know, they will overcome us and, you know, there's going to be Armageddon and so on. Um, I, I think the way to think about it is that we will be uh, in some way technology augmented or enhanced. Now, that also brings a bad idea. They think you put a chip behind your ear and stuff like that, cyborgs, right? But uh, what I mean is not that. This morning, I'm sure you are already kind of technology enhanced because you may have looked at uh, the, the, your calendar, right? Uh, you may have, or, or, or yesterday you had to go somewhere and uh, you used uh, the map, right? And uh, for, for driving, right? Uh, or if you have an Alexa device or, or, or a Google Home or something, you may have asked. Uh, in fact, just before coming, I uh, just asked uh, Alexa about uh, what different people mean by the word singularity, because I thought that may come up, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, and now, uh, so in that way, we are already technology uh, enhanced or augmented. And I think if we see it in that way, rather than seeing a dichotomy that this is intelli uh, machine intelligence, the human intelligence, but how can we use that to improve ourselves. I think that uh, at the way the computer learns is obviously different to the way we learn and, and a lot of it is dependent on that earlier thing I talked about which is multidisciplinary. We, 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 we have empathy, we have a lot of things like that but a computer, a software that is trained to do something, currently we still are in the so-called narrow AI thing. You know, We train one uh, algorithm to solve one problem. Those who are interested may want to know that there, there were some big advancements on that front um, uh, with respect to games, and I, I think Harsha may be, you know, as, as a chess player, he would have been very interested in, in the game uh, Go, where they, they kind of showed that there is a possibility for a computer software to be transferred its learning from uh, chess to Go, for instance. But that is quite different to the kind of way our, the we transfer our learning to different things, right? But because of the success of that program uh, that was done by a company called DeepMind in, in London, people feel that, you know, this so-called artificial general intelligence is, uh, you know, imminent. It's going to come in the next five years, 10 years. Uh, and uh, my personal belief is it's not, but the fact that we humans are able to uh, think across our discipline and into various aspects is what differentiates us from the machine. So how do we use, I, I saw, um, uh, I think one of the world famous heart surgeons uh, had said that I can't um, operate anymore with my bare hands, right? Because, uh, he has performed, I don't know, 900 operations or something. Through that, you know, he goes into this thing like a booth and uh, he can see uh, because there are cameras all over the, uh, the patient and he controls, he can control to a very fine level 
how the robot arm manipulates more fine than you know with his own hands and so that's a technology enhanced human being still it's a human being that robot can't do it by itself well some things it will be able to do um, but other things it won't be able to do so but i want to take up something that the vice chancellor said and i think that that this uh, the whole idea of coursera or, or any of those uh, things is that i tell my students when i go to class i'm i'm doing a class on natural language processing you know the best guy in this field has a coursera course so please go there you don't have to come to my lecture right but still most of them come because they want a bit more spoon feeding right um, but i think that's the way to go this whole thing about the flipped classroom which we learn i don't know cth mm -hmm. or st or whatever we learn um, where we tell them to do the work and they do the homework uh, in class right so you see okay what what were the problems when you try to understand it or what what was the homework that you couldn't do and so on so i think much more Pe when when people say you know 15 uh, i have only two uh, 15 sessions of two hours to teach this course i think if you have five sessions you can still teach it it's a bit like uh, some you know some students come and say uh, i wrote my dissertation they want this paper to be five pages but they they had to write an abstract which is a half a page right so so we should be able to you know teach a course that means we put more of the load onto the student right but we are not used to that we are not used to putting more load on the student to see how they learn right um, i still remember i have to thank uh, professor kiyakaratna for i think many of you who have gone to cthe and all would have done this but one of the big problems is that when we we have we also fall into this theory x theory y management people will know right theory x means we say you know what to do this is the this is the, this is the, who the student is the student i get is this so i can't do anything about it right but theory y person is a, a little higher he says no it depends on me not the student student can be anybody i i go there and i perform and that person is the next person to get dissolution because you perform and you get their attention for a little bit and then back to square one right so he eat uh, john briggs i think talks about uh, a level three teacher doesn't care who the student is nor what the teacher does but what the student does what does the student do as a, re as a result of my interaction with the person with, with the class and and if we focus on that then i think we will succeed so um, i normally ask people okay how many hours did you put in between our last meeting and this meeting one week apart and general answer is zero right um, and so i tried to do these uh, flipped classrooms and, and i think i went a bit overboard one day one one, one student said uh, so i had to put 12 hours between I thought, yeah, I, I expected success to be the number of hours, but uh, then I, I realized I had to adjust myself. You know, 12 hours on one subject is too much. So, but then, but then I, I'm able to say, right, okay, I think you should be able to put about two two-hour sessions in, in the week, right? And you should be able to do that to all the subjects that we do, because we do, I don't know, they take about four or five courses for, you know, at a time in a semester. And so they should be able to, you know, spend that time but unless we give that thing, you know, they won't do it. So, so what if you are focused, what is the student doing as a result of my interaction? Uh, then I think we will be closer to this, um, you know, self-learning that the vice chancellor was talking about. Thank you, uh, Ruan. Uh, I will move on to the next question, which is from Dr. Siat Gunavardhana. It's actually the kind of question I would have expected from Siad too. And this question is for Dr. Atarupana. So, Harsha, I hope you're standing by. How critical is attracting foreign direct investment to Sri Lanka in the fields of the fourth industrial revolution? And what sort of macroeconomic policy will bring them here? Also, what countries hold great promise in bringing investment to Sri Lanka in developing infrastructure necessary to elevate to a 4IR-based economy. 
Harsha, over to you. Uh, thank you, Usia. So that's a very broad question and not easy to answer in one, uh, you know, in a few minutes. So well, let me say, broadly speaking, we need to keep our economy open. We have two ways of handling the kinds of FDI that can come in, and is of course extremely important to have for indirect investment. One is using, you know, contact networks, Sri Lankans working in overseas industries and universities, uh, using our own uh, university business linkage cells, uh, see how we can establish uh, relationships in these areas and try and stimulate for indirect investment. The other is to just leave it to the market. So let the market you know, use these links and then see what can come in. But of course, it's extremely important to get foreign direct investment because our own capital available for investment in these areas is almost non-existent. Uh, GERD, for example, the gross uh, investment in research and development is very small. And uh, in the near term, we don't really have the macroeconomic space to invest on a large scale from, uh, from, from our own government resources. Uh, so I hope that's, that's, that's a broad answer. It could be done using what we call social capital, using our contact networks, our relationships uh, to try and stimulate that investment. But it is very, very important that we get foreign investment in the four, fourth industrial revolution industries at least in some of them. Maybe biotechnology would be a good area as uh, one of the speakers, uh, one of the panelists mentioned, but also other areas, um, these can't be directed. These have to sort of spring up based on uh, contacts and networks based on social capital. Thank you, Harsha. I know that was a rather challenging uh, question. Uh, I have, I'm going to take two more questions from the online audience and then I will turn the floor over to the physical audience present in the hall with us. Uh, so our next question is aimed at, uh, once again, at Dr. Ruan. Uh, not sure who's asking it. Dr. Ruan, do you think that the ragging will stop now that, we, uh, that there have been two batches that entered the university during COVID time? I completely agree. How can students think freely when they are not able to relax? It is physiologically not possible. I think this is a question for the vice chancellor. But <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, uh, I, I think actually, it's not even for the vice chancellor. It's for all of us. It's for all of us. I mean, we have a golden opportunity. It, it won't stop by itself. You can be sure that. Uh, the, the students have had more free time to think about how to come back uh, better and stronger, right? So I think unless we have a definite plan in place um, uh, and not just like a you know, separate thing uh, we do for, you know, during orientation or something, but it's integrated into everything we do, um, I mean, there's so much of material, like, you know, the, if, if you just re look at the Stanford prison experiment, I mean, you can see how, you know, human psychology works like that, you know, when you, so that was a, a batch of students, undergraduates, right? So one, uh, there was like a, a case study, one batch, one group of students was given in charge of another group of students, right? More like a prisoner and a jailer kind of relationship. And uh, the psychological study had to be stopped because uh, by, not by the researcher, research professor, but the research professor's PhD student because uh, the level of violence got to such a state, right? And, and so there are several things, you know, several things in the literature that we can use to convince people that, uh, and we are, you know, there is a silent majority here, right? Silent majority. So silent majority is not empowered because of the way we have structured everything in the university, right? But I mean, I, I'm really hoping that, you know, in, in this, we will definitely not miss this bus. 
to, to change the way. Initiation is a great thing, and we should have initiations. The juniors laugh at the seniors, seniors laugh at the juniors, you know, that kind of thing, you know. We, we all have fun. But we have to change uh, the way the initiation happens. I hope, certainly hope that that will work, Ruan. And I'm going to take one last question from the online audience. This is from Professor Nalin De Silva. Uh, the question is aimed at Harsha, I think. How do you bring the corporate culture to the academic community to address the productivity and accountability? Due to the artificial intelligence and technological singularity, most of the jobs will be redundant, and it will apply to academics as well. I prefer if Harsha can talk about any reforms to the system. Another challenging question for you, Harsha. Yes, so thank you. Uh, so that, again, is actually many questions in one, right? But first, I actually think that one should not bring the corporate culture into the universities. The academic culture of universities is very valuable and important on its own. And one should not corporatize universities. Universities should not, for example, be working primarily to generate profits, uh, incomes for shareholders, and so on. If universities are corporatized, uh, they actually will cease to be universities. How do you do basic research, for example, which is extremely important public goods aspects, but which may or may not gener immediately generate financial returns if you have a corporate culture in university. So I think universities have unique cultures of their own, which should be allowed to continue. There is an element, of course, where intellectual capital in universities could generate financial returns, the commercialization of innovations and research, for instance. And for these, there are mechanisms like the university business linkage cells uh, that the universities have set up and which we support through the World Bank's ahead operation. But uh, universities should not function like corporations. Uh, so that's my view. Uh, in terms of the loss of jobs, so yeah, so this is one of the, the one of the challenging aspects of changes in technology. Just as the first and the second and the third industrial revolutions meant some jobs, some jobs were lost, and other jobs were generated. We expect the same thing will happen in the fourth industrial revolution. Some of the current jobs will disappear over time new jobs will come up. And that's the challenge. How do we produce skills for new jobs? In terms of your comment, uh, Dr. Naveen, Professor Naveen, about uh, accountability and so on. Again, uh, so there are quality assurance mechanisms and so on, which are part of the ac accountability framework of universities and also the career structure, promotions, the kinds of incentives needed for promotions. But I'm very wary about too much accountability in universities. Uh, there, obviously, there has to be some accountability in universities for public investment. If the taxpayer is to put in money for universities, then we need certain returns in terms of employable graduates, in terms of uh, the kinds of research done and so on. But that should not be too restrictive. There should be an element where universities can engage in inquiry in the generation of knowledge, uh, which is left in the end to the academic community itself. So that's a fine balance, but I think that that is needed uh, for universities. Over. Thank you, Harsha. That was a very well balanced answer, which uh, I completely agree with. Uh, I, 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 would, I would now like to turn over the discussion to the audience that is physically present with us in the room. Uh, I understand that there are a couple of uh, microphones that are available. So do I see any hands raised? Hi, uh, I'm uh, Dr. Nehranga from the chemistry department. Uh, I have the question to Dr. Harsh actually. Uh, so we were, uh, you were uh, discussing about uh, democracy and uh, other concepts uh, that are paramount. 
uh, for the development. Uh, and uh, I was following, uh, basically I have to know your comment on this. Uh, so uh, Professor Michael Sandel at uh, Harvard University, he uh, recently wrote a book, not actually that recently, but about five years ago. Uh, the title was Tyranny of Merit. So basically, uh, he was referring to the, uh, the, the populist movements that were happening due to the uh, lack of communication or uh, lack of understanding of the general public about science uh, or about merit in general. And because of that, uh, there's a divide between the general public and the educated communities. Uh, which I think is uh, connected to all of the faculties in general. So what are your comments on that? Uh, so there again, uh, of course, so there'll be many books written on many topics. So on the issue of merit and you know the general lack of understanding among population, these are topics for discussion. I, I think this is something that has to be uh, these are also areas for research and for discussion. I think that if a society promotes merit in general, that is helpful. But again, meritism is a is a is a multi-faceted uh, concept, right? Because merit can be many types of merit, and, exactly. and uh, there are, for example, many types of skills, many types of uh, abilities, competencies. So again, uh, it's difficult to direct this uh, from a centralized authoritarian system. Uh, democratic market systems are more open to different types of merit being rewarded, but it's not a, it's not a perfect system. It's not 100% you know, foolproof. No human system is 100% foolproof, right? So these are human systems, but usually democratic systems give more opportunities than authoritarian systems. Mm -hmm. All right. Over. Thank, thank you. Uh, there's another small question uh, as a follow-up, actually. So uh, due to the uh, involvement of ar artificial intelligence and uh, augmented reality and uh, so forth, uh, you indicated that uh, many jobs will be replaced. And uh, so nowadays, uh, there's a discussion going on uh, in the uh, social media community, like uh, you know, in the companies like Google, Facebook, Amazon, like that, uh, where there will be a, a set of people who will not be skilled enough uh, to work uh, in the uh, new job market, uh, no matter what. And then uh, they are talking about uh, universal basic income and all that. So, uh, what are your comments on that? Thank you. So, I think this part of the whole discussion that uh, when new technologies come, there are people, particularly depending on their age group and so on, who need to be protected through uh, universal pension schemes, universal basic incomes and so on. So for instance, we see that in the labor markets, when uh, somebody loses a job and he or she is say, in their 50s, it's very hard for them to come back into the labor market. Uh, so that is where this whole discussion on an adequate pension and so on is needed. Again, these are challenging because uh, people live, live longer now than before. Uh, if you have a pension scheme that sets in in the 50s, hard to finance such a pension scheme unless it's a good contributory scheme that was started when the person was young. These are major challenges which uh, have to be worked out. But it's true that there will always be some people who will not be able to cope with the current technologies or the new technologies that come and then a caring society has to take note of that and provide for such people. So on that, I agree. The working, out, working that out, the mechanics of it is very challenging. Thank you, Harsha. Uh, due to uh, the fact that we are beginning to run out of time, I will restrict the discussion to one more question from the physical audience. If if anyone else would like to ask. Uh, I'm Mayuri from the Department of Zoology and Environment Sciences. Uh, I am uh, probably asking Dr. Ruan, uh, you said that it is better to give 
uh, a greater load to the student rather than us uh, trying to spoon feed. But I'm just wondering now, we do practice this uh, in their honors years, that there are smaller numbers of students. But in the first two years, as they are, uh, they spend almost the whole of their school career being spoon fed, uh, coming in to the university uh, with perhaps a language barrier uh, and perhaps other um, social barriers, um, adopting this approach in the first two years, how practical would that be? Would we be stressing the students a little more than uh, they already are? I think we all can answer these questions because we, we all uh, are part of this. But uh, my experience has been, yeah, I, I, I have also used to start with the honor students because uh, that's where um, we have uh, more attention because the batches are smaller. Uh, but uh, I think uh, it's hard to start something suddenly in the middle. Uh, if you start at least in a small way from the first year, you know, it's, it's even like uh, getting up or whatever. If, if you try to do it you know, in the third year or fourth year, it's a bit uh, artificial for them. But from the word go, if you do, then you know, there's uh, more of a chance. Just very quickly to uh, respond also to his thing about uh, this, um, you know, uh, I don't know whether you've read uh, Paul Feyerabend. I mean, he, he, yeah, he, he wrote a book, uh, he wrote an article, I think, called How to Protect Society from Science or something like that. So I think we need people to write how to, well, not write, actually, to, be, to actually do how to protect society from um, AI. Because uh, that's going to be needed, and, and all aspects like you know the pension, you know the, all all those, plus the kind of things that um, uh, that um, re related to ethics and morals and things like that. So so there are a lot of things, and 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 we are actually accountable because we are uh, more knowledgeable than the general man on the street, right? So we we have a bigger responsibility in that. Uh, compared to them. Uh, can I have a minute to add on to that? Of course, Preeti, go ahead. Just one minute. Uh, this is about ragging and social emotional skills and you know that sphere. So uh, just like what you said right now, I don't think you can suddenly uh, start career guidance in the university and then expect them to you know uh, completely uh, get this skill set of uh, uh, social emotional skills that are required for the world of work. So I think I strongly believe that it has to come starting from home and then primary, secondary, and so on. And then at the, this is like universities at like the tip of the iceberg where uh, when they come here, we can groom them with the exact skills that they need for the work, world of work or higher education. And I think internships in that respect, I think that really helps them. Uh, because I've been involved in uh, career guidance for well over 10 years in this uh, faculty. I think I can say that with confidence that it's like on the job training and they learn really quickly rather than us trying to sort of give them easy courses one after another. So just a comment. Thank you. Thank you, Preeti. So with that, I'm going to bring the discussion to an end since we have gone over time by, by just a little bit. Uh, I'm not even going to make any attempt to summarize the discussion because fascinating though it was, and I think it left us all with a lot of food for thought, it was also very, very broad in its scope, far too broad for me to attempt a summary. So instead of doing that, I will simply thank my uh, fellow panelists, or the panelists, I really wasn't one of them, I suppose, uh, for uh, this uh, extremely interesting uh, uh, discussion and I would like to particularly thank Harsha. I wish she were here with us, but that was not possible. But for joining us online and contributing uh, his, uh, as usual, amazing insights. And with that, uh, I'm going to turn over uh, the, the meeting to Dr. Caldera here, who will uh, wrap things up for us. Thank you, sir. Um, so on behalf of the Faculty of Science, I would like to once again thank all our panelists today. And uh, I would like to uh, give a special thank you to 
our moderator today, Dr. R.B. Gunaratna, for doing such an excellent job in facilitating a very interesting uh, panel discussion. And I think all the panelists also felt very comfortable. And I think uh, we as the audience uh, felt that as well. Uh, so thank you very much, sir. And I'd now like to call upon the ICAM's uh, conference chair, Professor Sanjeeva Pereira, to present our panel members and also our moderator with a small token of appreciation from the Faculty of Science. Thank you, sir. Um, so with that, we come to the end of our morning session. So with that, we come to the end of the morning session of the day one of ICMA's conference. Uh, I hope you have all had a very interesting morning, a fruitful morning, and I'd like to thank everyone for joining us, uh, both physically as well as virtually. I'd just like to remind you that in the afternoon, we will be having a, a session, a series of graduate talks on research applications of national importance, which will be held at 1 p.m., and this is a virtual event. Um, to wrap up uh, our session, I would like to finally invite everyone for lunch. Uh, lunch will be served uh, in the fourth floor of this building. I wish you all a very good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.